good morning and welcome to Westside Baptist Church. We are back in the sanctuary and we're very happy that you are here. God bless you all. We want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior. We want to welcome all of those in, in the sanctuary and whoever might be in the overflow in the fellowship hall and those people online. We welcome you. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you again that we can come into your house and we can worship you. Lord, we want to worship you by reading your word. We want to worship you by song, Lord, and we want to pray to you. Lord, we thank you that we have your word, Lord, and we ask that the Holy Spirit would show us the things that you want us to learn, Lord, and then we would go out and do those things. And I pray this in the name of your Son and my Savior. Amen. The scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 3 through 5. And it reads, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort also. And let's pray again. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you that the Holy Spirit will teach us and show us what we need to learn. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have right now, Lord. We haven't had this opportunity for several months, Lord, and we thank you that we can come back into your house and that we can worship you and I pray this in the name of your Son and my Savior. Amen. Good morning. How are we all doing today? If you will, stand with us and we'll sing when the morning comes.
What a joy to see you this morning, and what a joy to hear you singing as well. That truly blesses my heart. Thank you for being here, as Brother Larry said, and for those also maybe in overflow or online. We are so glad uh, that you are with us today. And uh, maybe, I don't, maybe you're a first-time guest today as well, and uh, we would encourage you to text. What are we texting? The word welcome. Text the word welcome to 859-986-3444. And there will be just a little bit of info there to fill out. We'd love to welcome you in a much better way as well and more intimate. And so we encourage you to do that. Text welcome to 859-986-3444. Well, uh, this is a great day also for us to return to church. But it is also a special day uh, as this is Memorial Day weekend. And as we turn our thoughts toward Memorial Day, we understand that it is a time to remember and honor all military personnel who died in the service of our country, particularly they, those who died in battle or as a result of wounds sustained in battle. Memorial Day was established uh, just three years after the Civil War in 1868, and Memorial Day was once known also as Decoration Day, and a few people I've known still call it Decoration Day, but today we know it better by Memorial Day. And it was a time to decorate the graves of fallen soldiers with flowers. But also for uh, us through time, we have also used this day or this weekend to remember all of our loved ones that have preceded us in death. You know, God has given us memory. He's given us the ability to love, the ability to show honor, the ability to show appreciation for those that have loved us and also served us in a variety of ways from those who have served our nation, our families, our communities, and our churches. So while we are able, while we are able, we must remember why we have this holiday. And it's not just an, an extra day to, to party, so to speak. Certainly, we get together and have fellowship and joy with family and friends. But it is a time to remember and not forget those that God has used to bring freedom into our lives and also blessings into our lives of many kinds. So, we are to show honor. We are to give thanks to God above for the people that through His many mercies He has placed in our lives. Romans chapter 13 and verse 7 reminds us of that. It begins by saying, Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. But he goes on to say, Respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. And so may we today and tomorrow and also throughout our lives as Christians give honor and show respect to the men and women that have given their lives for our freedoms. And may we genuinely also remember the lives of family members and friends that God beautifully adorned our lives with. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you at this time. We thank you for many blessings of being able to come and worship here today. And we are at this time mindful in the service, Lord, to honor those, to respect those that you've placed into our lives for many freedoms, freedoms that we enjoy today. And so, Lord, we thank you for brave men and women 
throughout the many years that have given their lives so that we could experience these things. We also remember, Lord, those that you brought into our life and made a deposit into our life with theirs. How they blessed us, Lord. How they taught us, how they trained us, how they loved us. And Lord, now they're in heaven with you. And Lord, we just thank you for those lives. And we pray, Lord, that we also will live such a life that when we're gone, that others will still be impacted by how we touch them. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of his children said today, Amen. Amen. Well, we cannot worship with our tithes and offerings like we regularly do, but we still take time to worship and acknowledge our giving. And so I read first from 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 12, and it, I'm just going to read the first part of that verse. And it says, And they faithfully brought in the contributions, the tithes, and the de dedicated things. And I just, from that scripture, reading that this week, I wanted as your pastor to say thank you. Thank you so much. Not only those who are here right now, but also some of our people that have not returned yet watching online of how you faithfully continued to tithe and bring the offerings and dedicate your life even while we were, were not able to assemble over the last couple of months. You were faithful to do so, and you have blessed the Lord, and you have blessed the Westside Baptist Church. And I am so especially thankful for that. We're going to have a prayer dedicating our offerings over the past week and this upcoming week by Brother Jason Mays. And then Brother Brandon is going to lead us in the doxology. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to gather in your house. We thank you for the opportunities that you've given us. Uh, it's been several months since we've been able to gather together. And we thank you for watching over us, keeping us safe. We thank you for an opportunity to give back just a small portion of what you give to us, Father. And you've blessed us in many ways. And, and we thank you for those that uh, give with a glad heart, Father, and that are happy to, to further your kingdom, Father. And we pray for that. We pray that your kingdom is uh, grown. We could pray for the lost that are saved. And, uh, just pray for those that need comfort, Father. And, you know each one situation, and we thank you for watching over us. Father, just forgive us the many ways we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Forgive me, Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You may have all this world. Give me Jesus. Well, again, let me thank you for coming today. This has been a special day, one we've been anticipating. And uh, I'm so glad to share this time with you as brothers and sisters. And so today's message is continuing on in the messages we have been preaching from Luke chapter 14, the two weeks before us. So I'm going to invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 12 through 24. And today, for a few moments, we're going to think about mealtime motives. Mealtime motives. And so if you are physically able this morning, I encourage you to stand with me in the honor and reverence of reading of God's holy word. He, Jesus, said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things he said to him blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God but he said to him a man once gave a great banquet and invited many and at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited come for everything is now ready but they all alike began to make excuses the first said to him I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, and I pause there, to make note that the you there is plural, you all. I tell you all, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word today. Thank you, and you may be seated. Today's message is about the tables that we set. Yes, it is about that. It is about the people that we invite into our life. Yes, it is about that. There certainly is a lesson of Christian ethics in this story, most certainly. But, as we'll see, and especially as Jesus Christ began to teach about the great banquet, it is much more than that. It is more than just a uh, moral of the story, so to speak. It is more about the invitations that we accept, I think. Whose table will we sit at, so to speak, figuratively, during our lives and throughout eternity? We will see, or we have read, an example of this host who had sinful motives, and Christ addressed those. And then we will also see today the good host, God himself, 
That invites us to come and dine with Him, to partake and experience His presence, His motives of love and grace for each one of you today. Let's pray. Father, I ask, Lord, for Your mercies upon me this morning. Lord, I pray that You would use me to speak to Your people, that I would fade away and that you would continue to grow, that I would decrease and you would increase in their ears and their hearts, their eyes. Heavenly Father, and that today we all will be moved to rejoice in the thought of that great banquet that you have invited us to. And Lord, that we will be mindful today of the tables that we choose to sit and to sit at in our lives. Again, I ask for your grace upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, again, like I said, we've been preaching this. If you've been watching online, and, and if you haven't, I encourage you to go back and look at some of the past videos on Facebook or YouTube of these sermons. But we started at the beginning of chapter 14, and we saw where a ruler of the Pharisees, he was probably over a certain synagogue, had invited Jesus Christ to his house for a Sabbath day meal. Now, but we also found out that uh, that was a setup. They were trying to trap Jesus into doing a miracle on the Sabbath because under their rules, I didn't say God's rules or commands, but under theirs that they had added, they did not agree or approve of Jesus doing miracles and healing on the Jewish Sabbath of Saturday. And so they invited Jesus, and we saw in those first six verses where they also invited a man with dropsy, a sick man. And they exploited that man and used him to set him before Jesus so that Jesus would heal him and that they would have cause to come against him. This was not the first time Jesus had already broken their Sabbath, so to speak, not God's, but their Sabbath on several occasions before this. But Jesus turned that trap against them. And then I love this story. It's almost, I've read this story and preached from it before, and it's almost become a little more, I get more of a kick out of it, almost a little snicker behind it, because I see Jesus turn the trap against them and silence them. And then, as we saw in the first six verses, he sends the healed man out. It's like, you don't need to be here with these people. They're just going to abuse you. And he sends him out, but Jesus stays. <laughs> And the one that they had invited to, to entrap had now become a thorn to him. Jesus stays there and continues to speak to them. And in verses 7 uh, through 11, we saw where he kind of brings up and, and teaches them about or rebukes them how they were fighting and scrambling and scraping over the best seats because uh, it was about status to them. And if they sat the closest to the host, that would increase your status. And we talked about status symbols and how Jesus was preaching against that or teaching them. And then in verse 12 that we just read, he turns his attention back to the host and he begins to talk about mealtime motives. You see, beloved, listen to me very carefully. Motives are the fuel that power what we do and why we do it. Motives are the fuel that power what we do and why we do it. And that's what Jesus was doing here. He was coming against the motives of this man. You see, it was common in that day at these big feasts and Meals of who they would invite. And they would invite certain people that would increase their status in society. Inviting some that if they did them a favor, they could repay them. Let me tell you what Jesus is not saying in this verse. He is not saying that we do not have times where we celebrate and share meals with family and friends. Because Jesus did that. And we read that in the Gospels. Certainly we have meals with our families and friends. He was attacking the motives of this ruler of the Pharisees. Of who he'd invited and why. You remember that old show, some of you will, 
Uh, the young ones won't, but the lifestyles of the rich and famous. You remember watching that show back in the 80s, I think? Well, this is not an episode, so to speak, of the lifestyles and the rich and famous, but it is, that's how they treated a lot of this in their society. And sadly, even among the religious leaders, the Jews, and even on this Jewish Sabbath, and who was he talking to here? Again, he was talking to the host. He said, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends. So again, he's looking at the motives. He's not saying we never have dinner with friends. Or your brothers and sisters, that word can mean, or your relatives or rich neighbors. Lest they also invite you in return. In other words, that was the motive for much of these dinners. Let's go a little deeper into that thought. First of all, and he goes on to teach about inviting people that can't repay you. Because there you find true reward, and you're not using and exploiting other people for your needs. See, this is a picture of the world's table, is what I'm getting at, and what Jesus was teaching and, and the world's table doesn't invite the poor, the lame, the crippled, and the blind. Unless they want to exploit them. To make themselves look better. And we certainly see that. Or sometimes just to feel better about themselves. And even that can be dangerous. It is true, we live in a, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine society. Amen? Amen? Let's be honest, that is the world we live in. And sadly, I want to say this can too often still be a scene among God's people today. The truth is, the Pharisees and the religious leaders and other Jews on the Sabbath especially would not have invited these people to their house, to feast with them, and to be honored at a banquet. They would not have, for one reason, because they considered them unclean. And since it was the Sabbath, they didn't want anyone to destroy their cleanliness that they thought. Secondly, they believed, especially in that society, it still goes on today sometimes, that they believe, well, since they are poor, blind, crippled, or lame, this must be God's judgment on their life. You've heard people say things like that before, haven't you? Oh, I bet they're just getting what they deserve. They would not have, and the world doesn't either. If someone can't scratch their back, they don't want to take the effort to scratch theirs. The motives at this table that we're speaking about today that Jesus was attacking are these. Will the guest help my status? In other words, you realize that today at this point, we're talking about more than just who's sitting around a physical table. We're talking about our lives here. Will who I'm around help my status? In other words, what can I get out of this relationship? Those are selfish motives. They're motives of exploitation. Will the guest help my status? Will my party be the best? Some people are like that, right? And I'll show everyone else up. And that's what happened in that day, and it still happens today as well. Uh, one person throws a party, and, and then some come away and say, well, we're going to invite you all to our house on the next holiday. And, and then they work to really outdo the other. Show them up. You see, this is not only the world's table, this is Satan's table. Satan himself wants to be honored and worshipped. This is the world's party that we're part of. This is what we're seeing today. And the questions we have to ask ourselves is this, is, is this our party? Again, you know what I mean, is this our life? Is our life just about these mealtime games that we play? Do I exploit people? Who do I invite into my life and why or why not? Am I this host? 
I would go even farther as we continue to think about what invitations we accept. Do we play this mealtime game by accepting this kind of lifestyle that others invite us into? You see, the point is this that Jesus is making, that our motives as genuine Christians should be ones that glorify God and not ourselves. That shine the spotlight upon Jesus Christ and not upon ourselves. Our motives as Christians should be one of trusting Christ for our reward and not the temporal rewards of this earth. And he spoke about that in verse 14. He said, and you will be blessed because they, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And my question for myself this week was, Alan, what are you willing to trade for God's glory and eternal rewards here on earth? And when Jesus taught this, then this one person, this one guy speaks up. And you know that when you read this in this context, you know this person, right? It's the person at the party that wants to be cute and clever and make a statement. And here again, this man's trying to be spiritually cute in this terrible setting of the game, mealtime games. And he says in verse 15, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, he said to Jesus, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is like, buddy, I don't even think you're going to be in the kingdom of God. And you say, it doesn't say that, but look at what he taught next. And we'll look through that. This guy had a false sense of security, and I'll tell you why. Because he was a Jew, the chosen nation. He was from the seed of Abraham. No way he was going to miss the kingdom. He's on the, he is just experiencing the Sabbath with his religious crowd and the Pharisees. He assumed that he would be at the great banquet in the kingdom of God. He had a false sense of security, and too many still have a false sense of security in their lives today. I hear people sometimes say, you know, I've got a good heart. I, that's not what the Bible really teaches us, does it? It teaches us that the heart is deceitful above all things. Usually when somebody says, now I have a good heart, those are the ones I know they don't have a good heart. Because if you have a good heart, you usually don't have to tell everybody you have a good heart. Amen? Some people assume too much and they have a false sense of security for the kingdom of God. Well, mom and dad uh, took me to VBS, and uh, when I was a kid, I went down forward with some others when I was younger and prayed to prayer. I've been baptized. I'm a member of the church, and all those can be, they are to be part of our religious and spiritual experience and our relationship with Christ and the church. But I want to tell you, that can be a false sense of security for many people. They're not truly safe. They've not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. They're not truly worshiping Him. And therefore, after this guy thought he was being spiritually cute, Jesus began to break into a parable, a parable of the great banquet. But He said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Now the thing about this parable is, is this parable reveals God's invitation to His people throughout the ages. His chosen nation, Israel. And how in great part, and especially among the religious leaders of that day, of how they rejected the invitation. Because they rejected the invitation because when the kingdom of God stood before them in the person of Jesus Christ, they didn't want to go through that door. 
They had heard for centuries about the great banquet. They assumed they'd be a part of the great banquet. They had heard the first invitation of the prophets for many years, and they treated the prophets poorly too. They persecuted and killed the prophets. And now Jesus Christ has come to basically say, come for everything's ready. I'm here. I'm the Messiah. I am the Son of God. But they didn't want to go that way. And so Jesus goes on to teach in this parable. But when it came time for the real banquet, when everything was ready and the servant went out, they began to make excuses. We read where the first one starts to talk about he bought a field and he needs to go inspect it. Well, how many people buy something without knowing what they're buying first? This man knew what he was buying. He did not need to expect it. And the same is in the second case with the man talking about he had bought the five yoke of oxen. He knew what he had gotten before that, but he used it as an excuse. The third one uh, in our day, I would say, is the most appropriate. I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Men, how many times have you had friends, but your wife reminded you of something, and then you had to say, I can't come. But even that really wasn't the situation. See, we giggle about that in our day, but truly in their day, that's even more laughable because the wives were not even invited to the banquet, so to speak, unless they were serving. These verses were flimsy excuses, and they show how material things, listen to my words, how material things and earthly relationships, like these mealtime games we play in life, how they keep us from the kingdom of God. And how many say and assume, oh yeah, I want to go to heaven, but I have to give my life to Christ? I mean, really give my life to Him and serve Him and worship Him and love Him? And live for him? You see, the Jews assumed that they would be at the great banquet, but they rejected the servant's message. You see, that's the thing about this parable. The servant in this parable is Jesus Christ. I've come, things are ready. But John 1.11 reminds us that he came to his own, and his own did what? They rejected him. And still many today say, I, I, I want to go to heaven, but for all that cost of discipleship, I don't want any part of that. And by the way, if you'll read in the verses next, for next week, verses 25 through 33, we're going to look at that. And so Jesus teaches that when uh, the servant spoke these things to the host, which is God the Father, says, Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, You go out quickly to the streets and the lanes and city, and you bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the truth is, this is all of us, and this is the gospel at the cross of Christ going out to all the world, to all the nations. We are the poor in spirit. We are the blind spiritually until Christ removes the scales and we see Him. We are the crippled just kind of dragging through life until Christ gives us hope and direction and purpose. And the same with the lame. But it, it gets even better. He goes on to say, he said, well, we've already done all those things, and there's still room in the banquet hall. And the master said to the servant in verse 23, well, then you go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. You see, God wants his house filled, beloved, and he wants it filled with each and every one of you here today. And not only that, But he wants it filled with the people that society rejects. And by the highways and hedges, you think about his words there. He's talking about going outside the city where people are hiding, outcast. 
maybe even thieves, where they place themselves in the hedges. The liars and others. God wants to transform their lives too. Now, they, they don't get into the kingdom just by being physically poor. We understand that. Or by being physically crippled or lame. We understand the story is teaching us much more than that. And yes, he comes to the thief and the sinner to change his or her life. The ones that are hiding in, on the side of the highway behind the bushes and the hedges. But he is teaching us that the great servant Jesus has come. And at the cross he said it is finished as he paid the price for your sins and my sins. And the invitation of Jesus has come. Why is that his invitation? Because he came to do the Father's will. And the Father says, come. Sit at my table. Accept my invitation. That's the gospel message. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came that we might have a place at the table in the kingdom of God throughout eternity because he so loved us. He gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that I could have a seat at the table in the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. That he came to... We who are poor and lame and crippled and blind, thieves, sinners, hiding in the hedges. What a blessed thought that a holy God would so desire to have fellowship with me, such a sinner as myself, such a sinner, unworthy. that he would want me at his table when this life is over, and even now, through worship. You see, the greater question here in light of this story is this. Which invitation will you accept? Satan's going to prepare for each one of us and has some beautiful tables in this life. Sometimes where we can rub elbows with others and get things. Have things the way we want it. There are many trappings and beautiful things laid upon this table, but your reward is here. And I want to remind some of you young people as well, that the world will invite you to the table at times and they might treat you good, but as soon as you don't add any value to their life or you can't bring anything, they'll kick you out of your seat and they'll bring someone in else to fill it. And we've all seen that. They'll quickly do that. When you don't meet their needs anymore, when, you don't get what, when they don't get what they want from you, you're no longer a friend. Or will you accept the invitation? Throughout eternity with Christ. That's the real question here in this story. And that's the question that is before all of us today. First of all, if you're not a Christian, you're going to have to make a choice today. Whose invitation are you going to accept? Are you going to receive? Are you going to receive the servant, Jesus Christ, that came to say, everything's ready for your salvation now? You can be forgiven. You can have new life, joy, purpose, peace, not only in this world, but in the next that will last forever. Or... You can continue to play the mealtime game with the world. I, it is my prayer, it has been all week, that each person under the sound of my voice will accept that invitation from the servant Jesus Christ today. 
and that you will take Him as your Lord, that you will love Him and worship Him and serve Him and live for Him. That has been my prayer today. And for we who are Christians that have truly been saved, but still we might have slipped into the game, the mealtime game, and we've started to play these religious games like they were in this scene today, and we need to be reminded to lay our or store up treasures in heaven above and not here on this earth. Knowing and trusting that God will reward in the resurrection of the just. That God will bless us and that we want to bless Him when we do these things. And we want to honor Him and glorify Him and not ourselves. Today, if you would accept Jesus Christ, we do our invitation just a little different for a short while, hopefully. One thing is, even those watching online, I would encourage you is to text next step to 859-986-3444. We'd love to help you in your next step with Jesus Christ and pray with you and pray for you. Even if you're here today physically and you want to text that to that number, we'll get back with you. We want to be a part of leading you and helping you in your walk with Christ. Secondly, also, if you need to receive Jesus Christ today and you're here, when the deacons release you in just a few moments, release your row, and if you'd like to come and sit on the front pew, and I'd love to pray with you and for you. And lead you to Christ there too. Which table, which invitation are you going to set at in this life? I hope, I hope and pray that it is with Jesus Christ in heaven. Take him as your Lord today. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for your many blessings in this time. Heavenly Father, I pray for all those listening to my voice now that they would accept your invitation and that they would give their lives to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Draw us into yourself, Lord. And help us, Heavenly Father, with the many temptations and the beautiful tables that this world provides, Lord, that we would not trade those things for the eternal rewards that you have prepared for those that love you. We thank you for this day, and we thank you that the invitation still stands and will until you return. But knowing this, Lord, keep this in our minds and before our eyes that one day the invitation will end and the great banquet will start and not all will enter. Work through your word, Lord. May your Holy Spirit go before us and work in our souls and change us. And may we leave here differently than when we came in. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Boy, hadn't it been good to be in God's house today? Amen. We're so thankful. All of you have been here in the first service. Uh, I think we had about 53 or 54, somebody told me, and online as well. God bless you all. And I continue to share this, even though you've been here, so more people can hear the gospel message. Share it with your friends and family and your enemies as well. And may the Lord bless you as you go and as you come again. And Brandon, at this time, if everyone will stand, we're going to sing the chorus of We're Marching to Zion. And then the deacons will release your role. <laughs>